Welcome to Million Cups. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Rick Thomas, and I'm uh, glad to see everybody here this morning. We've got two really good speakers. And uh, how many of you are here for the first time? Yeah. Welcome. Yeah, welcome. Uh, for those of you that, um, that understand our Twitter feed, uh, this morning we've got kind of a new thing going on there. Uh, each of the speakers have posted some questions and some interactions, so you'll see some questions come up along the way, and we'd uh, really like it if everybody would join in and kind of answer some of those things. We're looking for a general survey of the audience. Uh, some have also asked questions about why don't you announce the speakers next week at the end of every session the week before. And a lot of that is because we don't necessarily know exactly who those speakers are. However, if you'll go to the website on Thursday, those speakers are generally posted on Thursday the week before, so you can find out there. Uh, let's see. Uh, we've got somebody from the Kansas City uh, startup crowd here in the audience today. I'd like to welcome Brandon Schatz. Brandon, raise your hand. Um, an interesting thing about Brandon, uh, that I'll embarrass him here in a second, Brandon has uh, a website called sportsphotos.com, and some of you all have heard me mention that before. And uh, Brandon had a huge responsibility or a huge part of making One Million Cups happen here in Springfield. And even though he is in Kansas City right now, he is a Springfield resident and grew up here. So with that being said, we're glad to have you, Brandon. So our first speakers this morning are Rachel Oglesby and Matt Perry. And they have a project called Shopsy. So. I'll hand the floor over to them. I'll hand the mic over to them too. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. Good? Um, my name is Matt Douglas. I'm the founder of Shopsy. This is my co-founder, Rachel Oglesby. We are an early stage startup uh, in mobile application space. We're currently working on developing mock-ups and hope to be in development here in the near future. Um, but we really wanted to kick things off today by starting uh, asking you guys all a couple questions. If you just raise your hand and leave it in the air in response to each question, we'd really appreciate it. So the first question I want to ask is, how many of you have ever seen someone using a product that caught your eye? It could be anything like a jacket, a pair of shoes, even like headphones or a cell phone case. Right, pretty much everyone in the room. How many of you actually went up to that person and asked them about the product, how much it cost, and where they got it from? A few, more than I expected, actually. OK. Well, I'm a shoe guy. I really am always looking for new and interesting shoes. You might be able to tell from the baskets that I have on my feet today. Um, and it kind of creates a problem for me sometimes in that I am always looking at people's feet. Um, when you walk in a room, I don't look at your face, I look at your feet first. And that kind of creeps people out sometimes, I think. But um, that's really the problem that kind of bore the idea of what Shopsy is. Uh, to put it simply, Shopsy is a mobile application that's going to allow you to shop for the products that you see and earn rewards in the process. So how does it work? Well, the foundation of Shopsy is an active network of just everyday people who post daily about the products they're using and earn points for doing that. Shopsy then uses geolocation technology to allow you to see the posts of other Shopsy users that you're, are in your general vicinity. So I'm gonna tell you a little story to give you a little bit pe better picture of how we see this working. Imagine a 25-year-old Shopsy user named Lauren. Lauren is a creative professional maybe. She's really into fashion and she regularly gets compliments mm -hmm. on her style. So Lauren, when she opens a Shopsy application, she's gonna see her virtual closet. Now, virtual closet is exactly what it sounds like. It's a virtual version of your real closet. So in Lauren's virtual closet are the items that she actually owns that she has uploaded to the Shopsy application and they're broken into categories like shirts, jeans, boots, etc. Now every day, 
Lauren is able to make a daily post by simply scrolling through her virtual closet and tapping on the product images of the products that she'll have with her for the day. And then as soon as she's selected all of those, she's able to push a button that'll broadcast that post. You can see on the screen there. And once this post goes live, it gets broadcast to other Shopsy users that she comes across through, throughout her day. This is maybe like a 20 to 25 yard radius, basically within eyesight so that when you're in a room with a group of people, you can shop for the, from the posts of the people in that room. Um, once she's made that post, imagine she's in a coffee shop. She's getting a latte on her way to work in the morning. As she's standing in line at the coffee shop, another user, we'll call her Jessica, is admiring the purse that, Je that Lauren has. So Jessica is able to open the shopping function on the application, and she's able to view all of the products posted that day by other users that are in that coffee shop. And she can view these products in two ways. So she can either look by category, so if she's looking for a purse, she can sort down to look just at purses, or she can view the posts of every user that's in the shop with her that day. So this allows Jessica to quickly find the bag that Lauren has that she's admiring. And once she finds it, she can read product reviews, view a product description. She can even save it to a wish list or buy it, late, buy it right then from the app. So let's imagine that's exactly what Jessica does. She just bought the purse that she's sitting there looking at on Lauren's arm directly from the application without having to Google search, without having to go up and talk to Lauren. So once Jessica makes this purchase, she's gonna see, Lauren is gonna receive a push notification to her phone that will tell her, congratulations, Jessica just bought your purse, here's 1,000 points. Now this is a big deal because the points are really the incentive to make the application work. So it really is the first full experience that Lauren has with Shopsy. Um, as she continues using the application, she'll earn points for everything from uploading a new item to her closet, making a daily post, and then obviously influencing other people to buy or save a product from her closet. So now the points, while they're good for your social status on the application, so essentially the more points you have, the higher your status. So you could become like the top trendsetter in Springfield, Missouri, if you have the most points. Um, but on top of that, it's also good as cash value for purchases made through Shopsy. So essentially what that does is it allows Lauren to shop more often for the products that she sees based on how often she's using the Shopsy application. So we like to sum it up in this way. Shopsy is really about three things. It's about sharing the products you love, shopping the products you see, and earning rewards for doing it all. So how do we grow Shopsy? Well, we really expect to see a viral en engine of growth for Shopsy, basically meaning we expect users will generate more users. Um, one of the ways that we plan to encourage this is by syncing Shopsy daily posts to external social networks. So when you make your post on Shopsy, you can sync that post to your Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, even blogging platforms like Tumblr. Um, and what that does for the user is it really broadens their influence and allows them to earn more points by reaching more people. What it does for Shopsy is it creates an efficient model of growth for us in that our users are bringing in more users by simply talking about the clothing that they wear every day, the products that they use every day. Um, one of the main challenges in terms of growth that we're gonna have is reaching critical mass. Um, as you can imagine, having an application that's based on a user network, we, we're gonna have to have condensed user groups. So one of the things that we're looking to do to overcome that challenge is releasing in selected cities and college campuses at a time. So instead of making it a global release, we'll launch specifically in you know, maybe Los Angeles and New York once we build up enough pre-registered users that we feel like it'll function properly. And we'll do the same thing across several college campuses. Once we have the minimum viable product into a couple of viable markets, then we can start thinking about how we generate revenue. And this is one of the things that I'm really excited about personally. Excuse me, I'm gonna grab a water real quick. Um, Shopsy will be free for users to download and use every day, but we're gonna explore a couple different avenues for generating the revenue. So. The first and obvious thing that we're looking at is advertising. 
we're looking at integrating some native advertising products uh, like promoted posts and suggested products. And our advertising products will be highly targetable, so a marketer could target down to a user's brand preference, their location, even their shopping habits. So what we're hoping that will do is create advertising that's highly relevant to the user and maximizes uh, conversions for the marketer. The second, and in my opinion, the more exciting way that we plan to generate revenue is by data sales. So you can imagine with a large group of people as this grows, if it gets into the millions of users and people are posting every day about the products they use, that becomes an extremely deep data resource in terms of what people buy and use every day. So what we want to do is we want to sell that to manufacturers, wholesalers, retailers, and others on an annual subscription basis and allow them to use that data to refine everything from product development to uh, merchandising decisions, even promotions. So what we're gonna sell them is not market research, it's really real-time, hard data that can be used for extremely accurate trend forecasting and market predictions. So we're really excited about the possibilities that Shopsy has going down the road. Um, we really see this as a platform that could transform the way that we all shop for the products that we buy. Um, and also, we really see it contributing a lot to other small businesses and helping them refine their processes. Um, if you guys would all give us some feedback by getting on the Twitter feed and responding to the question that uh, 1MC posted for us on there, we'd really appreciate that feedback. And I think we're ready to start the question and answer phase. It's not coded. Um, like I said, we've been working on mock-ups, so we have visual mock-ups right now that we're refining. Uh, we are currently looking for a developer to join our team as a co-founder. Rachel's in charge of the UI and UX for the application, um, and I have no coding background. So we're looking to bring on a third person to manage the, the development of the app in exchange for equity. On the technology side, um, the connection's gonna happen, are you gonna use low yield Bluetooth or location-based stuff and how are you gonna c cope with the battery loss? Yeah, so we are planning to use Bluetooth LE, so on the iPhone, which we'll release initially on iOS, that'll be iBeacon, same thing. Um, and we chose that mainly because it is the most efficient in terms of battery life. Um, initially, when I had the idea, I was thinking of using GPS. Two problems with that, A, it's too broad of a range, so, you don't want to be seeing results for people that are within two miles of you. You want to be seeing results that are for people that are within eyesight. So what Bluetooth Low Energy, the new version of Bluetooth, will do is it'll allow you to connect quickly with people in that 20 to 25 yard radius. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Yeah, uh, I was just curious. It, certainly when you hit critical mass, that's when you have 100 reasons for this to be successful and adopt and adoption will be super easy at that point. Right. Getting to that point, the number one reason the early adopters are going to adopt is that, are you anticipating that that's going to be points? And if not, what's the primary driver? Right, so a lot of that has to do with our initial target audience. We're really targeting initially um, younger adults, specifically the 18 to maybe 30 year old female target audience. Um, we kind of see this being something that'll fit into the natural use of someone like that. My wife is a good example of the target audience for this. She's constantly on Instagram posting pictures of her outfits and things like that, right? So this is just giving her a more efficient way of doing that. We are initially with the point system. I think that's going to be a big draw. We hope to be able to do the cash value for those points pretty early on, but at the very minimum, as a launch, having that social status and really pushing the social status side of it, I think will bring in the early adopters for that. Um, growing, that's where we see the cash value for the points becoming a huge deal in terms of kind of bridging that gap from the early adopters who are just using it mainly because it's fun and they like to share what they're wearing to getting people like me who, despite coming up with the application, I probably wouldn't use it until there was a cash value for it, right? And that's how we really plan on growing to the next level with it. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah. 
Given that most of the products you're looking at selling here are extraordinarily high margin, have you looked at any way of getting actual commission to the company out of the purchases? Yeah, so we've thought about that. One of the things that I've thought about in terms of that is uh, the way that we're going to be pulling in results is by we're looking at either crawling sites ourselves and pulling the data for the, the actual products from other e-commerce sites. So we're not selling anything, obviously. Um, with that, we don't want to get on the bad side of any of e-commerce sites because we, we don't want them to try and find a way for us not to be in their process, right? We want to help them. So initially, we probably won't do anything like that. Once we build market share and we have control over the market, we can reevaluate that. And one of the ways that I was looking at doing that or thinking of doing that is exploring the possibility of essentially becoming a payment processor. So just like Amazon charges uh, retailers who sell through their site, we could do something like that or even just doing almost like a PayPal. So when someone buys from our application, we take care of the payment processing so that the, the retailer isn't having to pay their payment processor that 2.5% or whatever it is, and that goes to us. So that is an avenue that we plan to explore as we get further down the road. I missed the very beginning, so I'm sorry if you answered this, but what does your competitive landscape look like? I feel like I've seen something like this before, and if I have, what's your point of differentiation? Right, so there are a lot of fashion apps out there, for sure. Um, our closest competition, there's two. There's an app called Pose, which is basically an Instagram for your clothing. So you take a picture of your outfit, and you tag the items, um, and you share that. Now, it's not location-based, and that really is the differentiating factor for us from every other application that's out there. No one is doing an application that allows you to shop products that are in your vicinity. So if you see someone with, within a room, there's nothing out there right now that lets you shop that person's outfit. So that's one of our main competitors. The other is The Hunt, kind of a similar you post the products that you own in a picture and people can tag that and then you can shop from the picture. But that's more, you're just finding people that you like on the, the site in general as opposed to people that you actually come in contact with. So. I don't think I need a mic. How will you decrease the amount of time that it's going to take for somebody to create the virtual Right, that's one of the huge challenges we have is making sure that this doesn't take a lot of time. We're really going to shoot for a target goal of um, you know, under 60 seconds for either adding a pro product to your closet and also for the entire time it takes to make a daily post. We want that to land under 60 seconds. Um, one of the ways that we're going to try and do that is developing a few different ways to add the product to your, your, to your closet. So we're looking into like some photo technology to where you can take picture of the item and it may be able to pull up some results for you to choose from based from that picture. Um, another thing that we're looking at is essentially a descriptive search function. So you would enter a brand, color, and then it would search the web and pull up relevant results with an image next to it so you could click visually the one that looks like your product so that we get the right product on there. But that's certainly one of our huge challenges. And again, having a developer on board with us will help us to answer a lot of those questions that I honestly don't have the perfect answer to yet. Yeah. Sorry, another question um, on the technology side. Um, one of the big things right now that's a really huge driver of sales and consumers is social media. So typically they say right now 70% of whatever's pinned on someone's Pinterest, they will end up buying. Um, it's a huge, I mean, the social response of what people think and or is a really applying to how people purchase and their consumer habits. How are you going to address that and add that social aspect and the communication side to what you're doing? Yeah, exactly. So I kind of alluded to it in the presentation. One of the main things that we're looking to do is sync the Shopsy post to external social media. So when you make your post every day, that's getting broadcast to your Facebook page as essentially like a grid of the products that you have. And that'll be branded with our brand on it. Um, and it'll be shoppable. Um, I think. Uh, so the follow-up question. For yeah. Then, what about inside, inside the page? So as you're... Connection people, is there gonna be that connection? Oh yeah, yeah. So one of the things that we'll integrate is the ability to, kind of like Instagram, you can like people's posts. So if you see a girl's outfit and you like it a lot, you could, you know, heart it, whatever, like it, and she'll see that. So you can build up. That'll be another thing that'll also play into the point system as we develop that, because that's that's essentially influencing people in in a small way. 
Um, but that's definitely something we're, we're looking at. We One of the concerns that we had a little bit in terms of that social interaction was how much do we open it up? Because we don't want this to be used for creeping. So we don't want you know weird guys using it to hit on girls in a bar or whatever, right? So we're trying to figure out how we can integrate things like comments in a controlled way so that it doesn't get abused. Um, but we definitely want to have that social interaction within the application. Just one clarification, does that does it automatically sync to their Facebook and Instagram, or do they have to say, I want it to sync? So they'll opt in, but they won't have to do it every time. So in their user settings, they can opt in to have it sync to whatever media they want. So if they have a blog, they could even sync it to post directly to their blog, which is also another big thing, I think, for pulling in our initial target audience. We're going to target fashion bloggers. Um, a lot of fashion bloggers post every day about their outfit, but they're having to go and pull product images of every product that they're wearing for the day and then do a write-up on you know what it is and how much it costs and everything. So that'll be something, I think, to get early adopters on board is to say, you know, all you have to do is use this application and we'll take care of that for you. Um, so yes, opt-in. You mentioned that when you launched that you mentioned New York and Los Angeles. Yeah. And my immediate response to that was, my goodness, these are extremely large metropolitan areas and and distance is going to certainly encumber a release like what you're talking about. I'm curious if you've considered maybe smaller design oriented schools that you could release in a in a in a smaller area or if you've considered smaller market releases so that you could constant get more in a concentrated area when you first come out and I'd like to know your thoughts a little bit more about that. Yeah, so one of the things that we're also talking about doing for our initial marketing push is to partner with maybe 10 to 15 of the top fashion programs in the country at universities um, and getting in with their student body who's already interested in fashion, get the application in their hands because as you said, you know, that's a condensed setting. So if we're on a college campus, we can get by with a few hundred users as opposed to a few thousand users and it'll be functional. So that's one of the main things that we're looking at doing for getting it out A, so we can test it and start getting feedback to refine the product, and then B, to start really growing our, our base from those college campuses. Um, that's a huge thing for us. And then also with that, we're gonna try and target some smaller cities too, so Springfield. Uh, being a local company, I think we'll be able to get enough traction to pull in a reasonable number of people to make it function well here in Springfield. Hopefully, if anyone in here who's interested gets on board, they'll accelerate that for us pretty quickly. But. Um, a technical question for you that I'm not, I don't know if you can answer yet or not. Okay. Uh, would be, uh, is your back end going to be developed in SQL? And, go ahead. I'm not sure, to be honest. Uh, I know we're looking for someone who can program in Objective-C um, and possibly C-sharp, but as far as the base of what we build it off of, I right. don't have the SQL would be that. for your database. You're, yeah. you're going to have to have a database connected right. to it. Yeah. Uh, the secondary question is how are you going to handle the security issues that will arise? Right. Um, that's a big deal. And again, unfortunately, without a technical background, I don't have a lot of knowledge in that. That is one of the key things that we're looking for in the person who comes on board is knowledge on how to manage the security side of things. Uh, I think one thing we can do is minimize the amount of information that people have to put on the application so that if there were to be a security leak, as little amount of important data is going to be lost as possible. So, And we don't need a whole lot to make the app function in terms of people's personal information. So, I had a question about the points. Um, if they have an immediate cash value to them, is that a liability that you guys are going to kind of bear, are you guys going to allow them to exchange those points for some sort of cash value through Shopsy, or are you going to partner with somebody else? And how do you keep, I guess, people from starting to use the app and you guys have an immediate cash shortage because you've got to right. yeah, offer those points to them? That's a huge thing. Um, and part of that comes back to what I was mentioning earlier is initially we'll probably release the point system as solely a social status system. 
um, until we can be generating revenue to feed back into that cash system. The idea is to have those be refundable through the application. So when you make a, pro a purchase through Shopsy, it has the value. It wouldn't be good outside of the application. But because we plan to pull in shopping results from all over the web, so say you're looking at a jacket that you really like, you're going to be able to see that jacket from every online retailer who's selling it and sort that by price or whatever, and then you'll buy that um, product from the application so that the point system stays native to Shopsy, so that you don't have to worry about redeeming your points outside of the application. Well, guys, that's all the time for question and answer that we have. We always wrap up with the same question. How can we, as a community, help you? So we're really looking for three things right now. The first and most important, we need to bring a developer on board. So if you know of anyone who's a developer, if you are a developer that is interested in this product, we'd love to speak with you, uh, get your feedback. Even if you're not interested in the product, feel free to come and give us feedback on the technical side. Um, the, second and, uh, the second thing we're looking for is uh, investing partners. We're gonna need uh, some capital to get this thing off and running uh, in the way that we wanna get it going, so that's another big thing. And then the third thing that we're looking for, Rachel and I are both young entrepreneurs. Neither of us have business degrees. Um, we work hard and we educate ourselves. And part of that education is we want to surround ourselves with mentors. So if you would be interested in meeting up with us and chatting with us and just you know imparting your wisdom, we would really appreciate that. So thank awesome. you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Let's give it up for Matt Douglas and Rachel Oglesby. So I have some good news from you guys. Uh, as always, we're always trying to add to this uh, entrepreneurial stack. And uh, I'll encourage you again to, if you know any networking groups, any sort of seminars, any sort of uh, resources that you think can help benefit the entrepreneurial community here in Springfield and the Ozarks, let us know. We would love to uh, promote it out to the group. Um, so I have two new events uh, and groups and networking opportunities uh, for the community. The first one is brought to us by the II Properties guys in the back, if you can wave and kind of say, hey, if you want more information about what I'm about to tell you, go talk to them. Uh, this is the Real Estate Investment Group. It's a free networking event that meets on a monthly basis. Um, they're meeting tomorrow, March 20th at 5.45 p.m. at the Pasta Express at uh, 325, 3025 West Republic Road. And it's $10 for food if you want to eat. You don't have to. Um, there's, uh, they have a large membership base already, and uh, they meet there every week, uh, each or every month. And there's a, a speaker there designed to um, help initiate conversation about real estate investments. Uh, and their website is reinvestorgroup.com. The next one is uh, brought to us by Heather Freeman and Crystal Spriggs. Did I get that right? And these two lovely ladies right here, say hi. Um, so if you have more questions about Springfield Collective, uh, talk to them after the event. And uh, Springfield Collective is a new network for small business creatives, but it's not just for small business creatives. It's, uh, uh, it opens it up and is centered around the creative industry. But uh, if, if you're in business and you want to get more engaged into the creative aspect, come check it out. They, uh, they're facilitating connections, informative uh, sharing and collaboration. They're meeting tomorrow at 9 a.m. at the Coffee Ethic. Uh, they'll be doing weekly meetups and quarterly workshops. And uh, check them out on Facebook. They have a Facebook page and they have more information about uh, their group here at the event. Um, so I get to introduce our next speaker. And uh, this guy has really, really cool story about bringing an idea, what it's just a concept, all the way to an international product. Um, and he's going to tell us all about it with uh, T1 Race Belts, Brian Mansker. Hey, guys. Thank you so much. I'm going to roll this out real quick. And if I could get a couple of folks, I'm going to hand you guys some, some samples of some of the new products that we have that are getting ready to hit the market. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we've done um, and how we came up with this idea is for my son, he's one of the top runners and triathletes in the country for his age. And 
he was racing and, and we were at one of the, the Iron Kids national races in uh, Oklahoma City and he came out of the swim to the bike and was fumbling around with his race belt and as a parent you just go, oh my gosh, what, you know, and there's nothing you can do at that level. You can't go help him because he's doing it on his own. And so we left that race going, there's got to be something better. We didn't leave that race intending to invent something. We left that race just to buy him a better race belt. Every race belt on the market uses the same backpack style clip. And one of the things that, that um, that's my son. Um, there's him with Hunter Kemper, one of the Olympian pros. Um, there's him, me having him show off a little bit, putting, <laughs> putting a couple of his medals on. Uh, you know, it, it started as a concept, okay? It didn't start as, I mean, I wish I could say, man, I knew exactly how to design this thing. I knew exactly what I was going to do, but I didn't. I knew that I wanted something fast, and the only thing that was fast that I could figure out was magnets. And so we actually went in, took an inner tube off of a bike, took it to an upholstery shop, sewed magnets into it so that they would slap either way. And we're like, okay, it's fast, it holds, looks like crap, <laughs> but it works, okay? And, and so... Um, then we we're like, okay, let's get a little further into this. So then we went with the female side of a standard buckle, and we took a Dremel tool and carved everything out of it, filled it with the magnets, and filled it with epoxy. That was the first time we had a real proof of concept, and that was the first time that we knew that, that you know, we could design something that would work. It weighed about 15 pounds with all the epoxy in it. I'm like, there is not a triathlete or a runner in the country that is going to put this thing on. So went down the process. Um, and so the next step was figuring out how I just happened to have a, a buddy here in town who has ESC engineering, Scott Bybee. And some of you guys know him. Amazing guy. Came in, loved the product. He said, you know what? Let me put a few of my engineers on it, and we will do that at no cost. He did it for free for me. And so, so the, the relationships went on, and then I went to a buddy who had an, it was an attorney, and he sent me to a patent attorney, Lathrop and Gage. They did a great job for me, um, received our patent this last year. Um, then we went to an international sourcing company. They had uh, contacts in China, so went through the process with them, got our, our molds, all of our injection molds done, and we ran into problems. In China, they will only do what you tell them to do. And me, with a background in video production and not a background in engineering, said, hey, all the bu buckles that I know are made of ABS plastic. Let's build ours out of ABS plastic. <laughs> they sent me 35 belts, and every one of them were, cro were, were, were cracked. Okay, And they had no solution for me. So I went ahead, went through the process to, um, to do some other things to get the right mixture with nylon instead of, of ABS plastic. And then I found out. The, the little folks over in China, they were trying to, to put these in, and the magnets were either pressed in too far, not far enough. That, so then I'm like, okay, I need a uniform you know, product. Because one thing about neodymium magnets is when they slam together, they break. When they break, they rust. Those are all bad things, folks. And so what we did is we custom made our magnets with a special groove so that it press fits in and then snaps into place so it is always in the same spot every time. Um, yeah, we had a few issues with the quality of that, and that didn't work either, so we had to go back. That was actually before we custom did our own magnets, which have been awesome for us. Um, as you can see there, you know, everything should look flush. Um, what most people don't think about when they're developing a product, you know, because you're like, man, I got this cool thing. And then you're like, how do I get it to market? What do I need? Well, you need packaging. You need, you know, don't stick this magnet on your pacemaker. You need UPC codes. You, 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 you know, you, you, need, you need a lawyer to write up 
a whole bunch of stuff that says, hey, this thing's got a warranty for a year and, and manufacture defects and da 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 da. And you know, you gotta have a great designer, okay? And Ben Bennett, who's in the back of the room, is my designer and web guy, does an amazing job. He's a phenomenal, phenomenal designer. Works for a company out of New York, but lives here uh, in Ozark and, and does all my stuff for me. And here's again where I'm not real smart, okay? This is a really cool packaging, really clean look that we were going for. That was our very first one when we didn't even have a product. Then we went to this, but I realized real quick that nowhere on there does it say magnetic race belt at all. You know, when, when a consumer walks into the store, he's got to see what's going on, and he's got to be able to, I mean, great, you got a picture of the magnets, but they kind of look like white holes. You know, so what are the white holes? You know, you just, you need to step people through that. So then we went from this design to this design. We have a runner, we have the, we're with the race belts. We've got the buckle. It says magnetic buckle, 28 grams, gel loop equipped. We put the things on there that step the consumer through the process. Um, how has it been received? You know, this is a big deal because the internet is so vast that it doesn't take a whole lot of people to blast a new product. It really doesn't. We have been very blessed. This is Triathlete Magazine in the US. They featured us. We sold a boatload of belts the next three weeks after this issue came out. Um, this is Triathlete Magazine Germany. Man, I'm sorry, I can't tell you what that says, but it's good stuff. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I do, when, when things come out in foreign countries, I, I do Google Translate them just so that I have an idea that it's good before I throw it out there. And so they don't go, this is crappy. And I'm like, man, look, in Japan, they're saying, you know. So um, I Google Translate all these. This is Velo City uh, News in Spain. There is Triathlete Magazine Canada. There is, um, what is this, Tri Sports in Japan. And everybody, I mean, I, I can read the title, What's Hot 2013 T1 Pro Race Belts. You know, I can get that. So the rest of it, a little sketchy, but they're saying good things about me. Um, this is our first expo. Um, this is a little weird. I'm not used to people coming up to me and wanting to take my picture because they own the product, you know? And you're like, all right, I'll smile with you because I'm really not that special, you know? Um, oh, let me go back there. Yeah, that's my son's, that's his game face. Okay, that's actually at the national championships coming into the finish line, and he had actually just finished there. So um, we became the, the official race belt of one of the most prestigious um, triathlon races in the country, Leon's world's famous, world's fastest triathlon. Um, this is one of our pros. As you can see, we put his name on it, okay? We, have, we work with five Olympians. We work with about three world champions. We work with 25 of the top pros in the world, and we give them belts. Through this process, what we've done is we put their name and stuff on it. We give them a belt for every single race that they do. This is Simon Whitfield. He carried the Olympic flag for his country in Canada um, in the Olympics. Pretty impressive. Um, Meredith Kessler took seventh in the World Championships at Kona, Hawaii this year. Um, there's Meredith and my son hanging out. Um, this is the coolest thing ever. Um, a buddy of mine who owns Kuat Bike Racks, Luke, some of you guys know him, and he sent me this picture. That race belt is on the ground on CBS Sports, and you can see right here that that the number's upside down, that's 001. That's Javier Gomez winning the Beijing International Triathlon with a T1 Pro race belt, the number one pro in the world. Um, some local folks putting my stuff on them, super cool. Um, there's a kids triathlon team that we support that has full kits with T1 Pro. Um, what's next? When we started, we didn't have a lot that differentiated us. Race belts ride up or slip down on people uh, a lot. The race belts that you've seen go around have a new polymer gripper system that keeps a race belt in place on women because women have typically have wider hips and narrow waist, so their race belts ride up and guys are built a little straighter the race belts slip down. Um, more pictures. 
we we went through the process um, with a international sourcing company here. Went great, sold the first four thousand belts, and placed the second order. And they tried to double my minimum and raise my price four months later. And that was our first clue that we had some issues to deal with. Um, we now have our own factory that we deal with directly, and we take care of. Uh, everything communication wise directly with the factory in Ningbao, China. So um, any questions? I want to start taking questions, anything? I appreciate you going through my 46 slides. Is your son legally involved in the business? He is not. He is not. Um, you know, we have to be really, really careful with him because of his amateur status. He's been as high as number three in the nation in triathlon, been as high as number uh, two in the nation in track and field, in indoor track and field. So, so we shelter him from a lot of things because we don't want anything to, we're hoping that he's going to pay for his own college. <laughs> <laughs> um, how many staff do you have currently? Is it just yourself or? What do you think? <laughs> One. <laughs> I mean, I, I do have I do have partners that 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 help me in website design and, and design and things like that. But but as as far as a, a still unpaid staff, I, I work full time with Office Concepts, and so um, as a startup, um, you know, it's not one of those things where um, you know I can take a full salary out right now. But we're getting there quickly. This is a phenomenal story, and it sounds like you've made a lot of the right steps. What do you want from this group? You know, um, I think two things in that question. I think, you know, if, if the right person was there and said, hey, I want to partner with you um, with capital, that's something that we would sit down and have the conversation. Um, I, I think more than anything with this group. I want to be involved in the group and I want to give back because I think there are, there are other inventors and entrepreneurs out there that maybe haven't been through some of the steps that I've been through and and that I can, can partner with them and help them in some of their processes. Help them avoid some of the mistakes I've made. Um, Brian, one of the things that comes to my mind is the limited market that you're existing in. I realize that there's a million people that do running events on an annual basis. And so my thoughts would be to ask you to tell us a little bit more about the possibilities for the buckle and not necessarily the race belt itself. Sure. You had mentioned the idea of it being a fastener to save lives for fishermen who are wearing waders, a quick release for the back of your neck to hold a fly um, net, and so on. So I, I'd urge the group to put your thinking hats on here and start thinking about all the different aspects that could be that this buckle could be used for as a brand extension into another market. Yeah, um, on that a little bit. I didn't patent the belt. I patented the buckle because I knew that there are a thousand good uses for, and maybe tens of thousands of good uses for a strong magnetic buckle. And um, Brian, you know, here at the E Factory, and, and and everybody that I've talked to knows that I, I'll make some good money in rice belts, but the big money is going to be in the buckle and how it's presented to other companies. Just a, a quick story on that. Um, when I was when I was just had a sample, I didn't even have a product on the market yet. You know, I've never been afraid to go in and talk to somebody. And I had a buddy at Bass Pro. He got me in the door at the corporate headquarters, sat down. I thought I was going to sell him a race belt because they do the marathon, they do the 5K, things like that. I get about 10 minutes into this presentation for this race belt that Bass Pro really needs to carry. And the guy's like, hold on a second. And he walks out the room. And I'm thinking, hmm, <laughs> must have messed up, <laughs> you know? And about five minutes later, he walks back in with eight guys. And he's like, this is Joe from Waiters. And we think that we could make a waiter buckle because if I fall down and I start filling up with waiters, this is a quick release instead of what we use now. 
this is Scott from Tents, and there are fasteners, and there are this, and there are that, and this is so-and-so from, from fishing, and, and then and the hunting guys, and man, we could put this around a tree with, with multiple of these, and we could get quick, you know, things for rattling horns. We could, you know, so I quickly understood that in the long term, the process is going to be much bigger for the buckle itself, but it is going to take more capital and it's going to take a team of people that have the right expertise to get in to those companies, whether it's North Face, Bass Pro, Cabela's, you know, whether it's, you know, little old ladies that, that just don't have the dexterity in their hands to be able to, to work a buckle, they can flex this and, and, and still be able to, to use it. So. To answer your question, yes, there are tons of, and we are looking for that right opportunity. Well, and I thought about this last night as I was looking at your site, and the thing that, the first thing that came to my mind was every single industrial worker or service person that walks onto a job site with a belt and, and like a hammer and a loop or, or tools or anything like that that they're constantly reaching for, the unique thing about this is, is that you don't even have to look down. You just have to get the object close to the magnet and it reattaches. So the idea that this belt buckle could become a third hand is really significant because you don't have to focus and take time off. You could actually it would increase the efficiency of anybody's workload. Absolutely. And if you're climbing, the last thing you want to do is be doing this. You know, you want to concentrate where your hands are going, things like that. So there are a lot of safety. I think there are also a lot of military applications to this. You know, I think that um, a lot of the folks that, that, that are out there that have been in the military are kind of shaking their head. Like, uh, yeah, I can see that. Um, these will hold 8 to 10 pounds of pressure. And when you're done racing, you can hold your kids stuff to the fridge. You know, when you're done. And you always know where your race belt's at. <laughs> I mean, who doesn't like that? I have two questions. One is, do you have a stronger version? I mean, 8 to 10 pounds, I noticed it was easier if you kind of snapped it to the side and pulled it apart. If you tried to pull it straight, it didn't go. But um, I don't know if you're up on the news, but last night, Graco had a big thing about, especially with car seats, the, the difficulty getting a child in and out of car seat if they are in an accident or something they could be trapped and that was a safety issue so I see that and the second thing I was looking at was you said that you're still not drawing a salary give us a timeline of when you said hey we've got a great idea to now I'm a business person who draws a salary um, you know starting a brand new product I I kind of in my mind had pictured, you know, three years, three and a half years, four years, that, that kind of that two-year window there. Um, at the end of, of three to four years, I feel like it's either going to go or it's not. I'm going to have some, some really, some, some solid um, foundation for what we're doing. Fortunately, like I said, people have been very, very kind to us. If you do a, a uh, search for T1 Pro reviews, um, they're all glowing. I, I, I expected Fuel Belt and some of those guys to come in and trash me, but they, they haven't. They've been very, everybody's been very kind. Okay. Um, how much do you charge for each belt, and how many have you sold this year or last year, your totals for last year? You know, we have sold um, several thousand belts a year since we started. Um, and the magnetic ones are 28.95 is MSRP. We have map pricing at 27.50. Wholesale pricing is 14.50. Distributor pricing is 10.75. Kind of lays out our whole whole spectrum. So to quote Kevin O'Leary from Shark Tank, um, have you looked at licensing? <laughs> you know, I, I I have looked at licensing. Um, I, I I went there with the guys at Bass Pro. I said, man, you know, maybe we could license this. They wanted me to be a buckle manufacturer for them, um, and as opposed to licensing. You know, I don't care as long as they're flying out the door. To be honest with you. 
Is it one size fits all? And I was going to ask you what happened with Bass Pro. So are you still discussing with them? Yeah, we, 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 you know, when I first talked to them, you know, it was one of those deals where I was well unprepared to be able to fulfill what they would need. And so, yeah, that is still on the table with them. Um, you know, I let them know that, you know, we're going to get this race belt thing solid first. And, and yes, it is one size fits most. <laughs> I've got a question. Uh, have you ever thought about not doing this as a sport buckle, but a fashion buckle, and doing different designs so that you could get to regular belt manufacturers? You know, I, I haven't, to be honest with you. Um, I think the fashion side of things is something that's very foreign to me. And I've tried to stay in my sweet spot where I have uh, a working knowledge of, of, of the product and the people and what they need and what they want. Um, and, and I try to stay very laser focused so that I'm not over here and over here and let's try this and let's try that. I know what's going to work and I'm, I'm moving forward to that as opposed to going real wide at first. Uh, how long was the application process and what did it cost? You know, it was several thousand dollars. Um, I always I always give people a hard time when I, because when, when lawyers work on anything, it's expensive. Um, it's, it's not cheap in, in any stretch of the imagination. And I, and I gave him a hard time. I, g I gave my, my patent attorney a hard time one day because I got this itemized bill and it had like $36 or something for creating the bill. And I'm like, are you kid <laughs> kidding me? You're charging me for the time that it took to create the bill to send me the bill? Yeah. Come on here. Come on. So, um, but, and, and it, took, it took about two years to get through the complete process because we did a, a provisional patent to kind of get things lined out and then, and then we went into the full patent search and we did all that and so, so it took about two years to get completely through and receive my pretty little papers from the U.S. Patent Office. It was under, I mean, for this, it was under $10,000. And, you know, and, and patents, you know, I'm, I'm all on the fence about patents. I, I, because, you know what, I, I, to be honest, I would need $100,000 because you really have to buy patents in every single country that you want to protect it in. Okay, I, I did it because I want to be first to market. It's a small niche type market with the with the race belt stuff. The people that they're wanting to steal in China, they want to steal something that's going to sell 500 million of them, you know. And 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 that's not this. So I thought if I keep the wolves off here in the United States until we have a foot and a, a place in the market, you know, I can I can deal with that. I told somebody earlier, I have about four innovations away right now with some different things like a nanosphere for the belt, some some new designs for the buckle, so that when things do come up, then I hit them with a new with a new option, a new in a, you know, innovation. So to kind of quote Matta SGF's qu uh, tweet up there, what does this type of, it's not up there anymore, it's way down at the bottom now, but uh, to kind of quote it, what does this type of thing do to like any electronic devices in the body or in the pocket or like a heart monitor or anything like that? You know, a lot of the pros ask that right at the beginning because they all use power meters, they all use heart rate monitors, and they all use... Um, GPS, you know, watches and stuff. It doesn't affect anything except for if you take this buckle and you open it up and you stick it on something, it's going to ruin it. Okay? But you can have it closed and lay it against stuff. You know, when you have it on your body down below, there's there's enough distance that it doesn't interfere with any cycling, running functions of any electronics that you have. But don't stick it on your, your credit cards. Don't, you know, it is a magnet. Brian, you've been generous enough with your time to speak with some of our other clients about your experience contract manufacturing overseas. And kind of tangentially related, I've also handed out a lot of your belts to a couple of people in this room who have remarked to me, and I agree, the quality of the belts has gotten significantly better, but I understand that your price points 
are also significantly improved. Can you share some insights about what you've learned uh, going through multiple manufacturers and processes? And yeah, the, like I said, the, the first going through an international sourcing company, the price was twice as high as what I have now, my cost. Um, the, the getting the questions answered in a prompt manner was very difficult. Um, again, it was through Kuat Bike Racks and those guys that helped me get to a manufacturer in China. Because, I mean, what do you do? You Google search Chinese factory? Whatever. You got somebody that's going to take your twenty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 and what are you going to do? Hunt him down? And you, you, so you, you need help. I, I needed help. Maybe you don't, but I needed help. Because I needed to know that if I'm going to wire transfer 50 grand to somebody, that I'm going to get something for it. Because as somebody who's working a, a nine to five job, you know, you want to make sure that you're not making big mistakes. You know, so so that was a big process. I have helped other people and talked with other people about what I've gone through, and I'm always open to do that because, you know, if it wasn't for my buddy Scott Bybee and Ben and, and a lot of people who have helped steer me the right direction to get us to the point where we're at now. Does that answer some of that? Okay. Anybody that's going to present here, uh, this is the man that you need to look after and uh, watch his video again. And I know you're here this morning, but if you're going to present, use his example. You did a great job, sir. Thank you. Great, great job. Well, Brian, that was a great presentation. As always, we close with the question, how can we as a community help you? You know, as a community, um, there are a lot of companies like myself that are out there that 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 need that help that have a great product that that there are a few steps that that as an individual it's very difficult to take and to be honest funding is one of those difficulties and so I would encourage you know companies and and angel groups and 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 all the the folks that have this kind of resources to help yeah. startups I think that, that that's one of the most powerful things that a community can do is help new companies with resources because honestly like in mine I mean that's one of the, the challenges that I have. And once you get over the hump where your, your volume is enough, then life becomes easy. And I would, I would say that if there's any startup ever that is in a community that has that, when they become successful, they need to be a part of the process and, and, and give part of their proceeds to be able to help other companies that have been through what we're going through now. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Um, um, thanks to uh, Brian Mansker and Matt Douglas. Great presentations. Thanks for taking the time. Again, if anyone knows anybody that should be up here, please direct them to our website. We'd love to talk to them. If they want to talk to one of us, Devin Dillon, Rick Thomas, myself, we'd love to talk to him as well. So thank you for coming. Come back next week. Thank you for your support. <laughs>